Scientists dumped millions of frozen bees into one of the hottest places on Earth and walked away. A year later, what they found growing in the sand changed everything we thought we knew about deserts. And no, this isn't some clickbait fantasy. This actually happened. Keep watching and find out how a bunch of sleeping insects just solved one of humanity's biggest problems. The Sahara Desert is not exactly bee-friendly real estate. We're talking about 3.6 million square miles of sand, lock, and regret. That's roughly the size of the entire United States, or China if you prefer. Daytime temperatures regularly hit that 100 Swai and Zwenjin degrees Fahrenheit. That's 50 Celsius for those keeping score at home. If Earth had a do not disturb sign, it would be planted right here. So naturally, that's exactly where a team of researchers decided to conduct the most ambitious ecological experiment in modern history. Because if you're going to do something crazy, why not do it in a place that's already hostile to all life forms? The Sahara wasn't always a wasteland. Rewind about 6,000 years and you'd find grasslands, lakes, and enough vegetation to make a botanist weep with joy. Rock art from ancient civilizations shows hippos, crocodiles, and elephants casually strolling around what is now barren sand. Climate change, the slow natural kind that took millennia, turned the region into the furnace we know today. The question researchers kept asking was simple but haunting. Could we reverse it? Not through some massive geoengineering project that costs trillions, but through something small, something that already exists in nature, something with wings. Enter the mason bee. Not the honey bee you're thinking of. Mason bees are solitary, non-aggressive, and frankly, they don't get nearly enough credit. While honey bees get all the press for making honey and living in hives, mason bees are out here doing the real work. They're pollination machines. One mason bee can do the work of 100 honey bees when it comes to pollinating crops. They're the overachievers of the insect world, and nobody invited them to the party. Here's where it gets interesting. Mason bees have a superpower. They can enter a state called diapause. Think of it as cryogenic sleep, but natural. When conditions get rough, mason bees essentially freeze themselves in their cocoons and wait it out. Months, sometimes even a year, metabolism drops to almost nothing. They're not dead. They're just really, really patient. Scientists figured if bees could survive months in suspended animation, maybe, just maybe, they could survive being transported to one of the harshest environments on the planet. The idea was bonkers. Most of the scientific community said so, but Dr. Sarah Khatib, a Moroccan entomologist, and her international team didn't care what the skeptics thought. They had a hypothesis, some funding, and an alarming amount of optimism. The project kicked off in March 2019. The location? Southern Morocco. Right on the edge of the Sahara proper. Not the deep, movie version Sahara with endless dunes but the transition zone where the desert is actively winning against scrubland. This is where desertification happens in real time. Every year, the sand creeps further. Every year, more land dies. The team collected 12 million mason bee cocoons from Southern Europe. 12 million tiny astronauts about to take the worst vacation of their lives. These weren't just any bees. They were specifically selected for their resilience. Bees that had survived colder winters, hotter summers, and general environmental chaos. The cocoons were kept in refrigerated containers at about 39 degrees Fahrenheit, or 4 Celsius, just cold enough to keep them in diapause, but not so cold they'd suffer tissue damage. Then came the truly wild part. They loaded these millions of frozen bees onto trucks and drove them into the desert. The release sites were chosen carefully. 20 different locations spread across 200 square miles. Each site had some remnant vegetation, acacia trees, struggling shrubs, anything that could theoretically produce a flower if given half a chance. The researchers didn't just dump the bees and leave, though that would have been funny. Mason bees love these. They lay their eggs inside, seal them up with mud, and call it a day. Here's what nobody expected. The shelters also included something else. Seeds. Thousands of native plant seeds mixed with a hydrogel that could retain water. The idea was that if the bees woke up, they'd need something to pollinate. And if there was going to be something to pollinate, it needed water in a place where rain is basically a myth. The average annual rainfall in this part of the Sahara is about 4 inches. Most of the U.S. gets 30 to 40 inches. London gets 23. This place gets 4. 
On a good year, the team installed solar-powered drip irrigation systems at each site. Minimal water, just enough to give the seeds a fighting chance. Just enough to see if this insane plan had any merit whatsoever. Then they left. 12 million bees, 20 research sites and one year to see what would happen. Dr. Khatib's team returned every three months to check the sites, collect data and probably question their life choices. Month one was rough. Most of the bees didn't emerge. The ones that did seemed confused, which is fair. Imagine going to sleep in Italy and waking up in the Sahara. You'd be confused too. Survival rate in the first month? About 8%. Not great, but that 8% was stubborn. Mason bees don't need a hive. They don't need a queen. They're loners by nature, which in this case worked perfectly. The survivors started doing what bees do. They explored. They searched for flowers. And here's the kicker. They found some. Those acacia trees. Those struggling shrubs. They were producing flowers. Not many, but enough. And the bees pollinated them. This triggered something botanists call a cascade effect. More pollination means more seeds. More seeds mean more plants. More plants mean more flowers. And more flowers mean the bees that did survive had more reasons to stick around. By month three, something unexpected happened. The bee population wasn't declining anymore. It was stable. Some sites even showed slight growth. The bees were reproducing. In the Sahara, a place where the very concept of reproduction seems like a cosmic joke. Month six brought the rains. Well, calling it rain is generous. More like the sky spat a little. But in the desert, even a little moisture is everything. The hydrogel soaked seeds from the original planting burst to life. Suddenly there were seedlings. Tiny green shoots poking through sand that hadn't seen vegetation in decades. The bees went absolutely wild. Well, as wild as solitary bees can go, pollination rates spiked. The team documented over 40 different plant species beginning to establish themselves across the sites. Native grasses, wildflowers, small shrubs, nothing massive. But compared to the barren sand from a year earlier, it was a jungle. By month nine, other insects started showing up. Not just bees, butterflies, beetles, even a few species of ants. Where there are plants, there's food. Where there's food, there's life. The sites were becoming ecosystems. Tiny ones, fragile ones, but ecosystems nonetheless. The researchers also noticed something else. The temperature at the sites was dropping. Not dramatically, but measurably. Vegetation reflects less heat than bare sand. Plants release moisture through transpiration, which cools the air. The sites with the most plant growth were recording daytime temperatures 3 to 5 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than the surrounding desert. That might not sound like much, but in an environment where every degree matters, it's huge. Now let's talk about the most shocking part, the part that made international headlines when the team published their results. By month 12, when they returned for the final assessment, the bee population hadn't just survived, it had exploded. From that initial 8% survival rate, the colonies across all 20 sites had grown to an estimated 2.1 million bees. Not the original 12 million, but considering where they started, even better, the bees had spread beyond the original sites. They found mason bee nests up to six miles away from the nearest release point. The bees were colonizing the desert on their own. No human intervention needed. They'd gone rogue, in the best possible way. The vegetation told an even crazier story. The 20 research sites which started as 200 square miles of mostly sand with a few sad plants, now had measurable green coverage. Satellite imagery showed a 23% increase in vegetation density across the entire study area. 23% in one year. In the Sahara. Let's put that in perspective. The Sahara Desert expands by about 400,000 square miles per year through desertification. This tiny experiment, covering 200 square miles, reversed that trend in its area. If you scaled this up, if you did this across even 1% of the Sahara, you'd be looking at reforesting an area the size of California. But wait, there's more. The plants that took root weren't just surviving, they were thriving. Root systems were stabilizing the soil, preventing erosion. The vegetation was creating microclimates, little pockets of cooler, more humid air that allowed even more plants to establish. 
It was a positive feedback loop. The kind that actually makes things better instead of worse for once. Other researchers started paying attention. The project, initially dismissed as a publicity stunt, was now being called groundbreaking. Pun intended. Universities wanted to replicate it. Governments started asking questions. Could this work in other deserts? The Gobi, the Australian outback, parts of the American Southwest that are actively turning into desert. Here's what makes this different from every other let's fix the desert scheme humanity has tried. It's cheap. The entire project cost about $400,000. That's less than a single house in San Francisco. Most desert reclamation projects cost billions and require constant maintenance. This one required bees, some seeds, and the audacity to try something completely unhinged. It's also scalable. You don't need massive infrastructure. You don't need to pipe water across hundreds of miles. You need insects that already exist, plants that are native to the region, and minimal irrigation just to get things started. Nature does the work. The bees pollinate, the plants spread, and the cycle continues. The real genius is in the simplicity. Humans have this habit of overcomplicating solutions. We want to build giant machines, engineer new species, or dump chemicals everywhere. But sometimes the answer is just letting nature do what it already knows how to do, and giving it a little push in the right place. Of course, not everything is perfect. Some of the sites failed completely. The bees died, the plants withered, and the desert won. Three of the 20 locations showed zero long-term vegetation growth. The researchers think it's because those sites had soil that was too saline or compacted. The takeaway, location matters. You can't just throw bees at any desert and expect miracles. There's also the question of long-term sustainability. Will these ecosystems survive without human intervention? Will the bee populations crash after a few years? Will the plants die off during an extended drought? Nobody knows yet. The study is ongoing. Year two is underway and early results look promising. But we're talking about fighting millions of years of geological processes with insects and seeds. It's not exactly a sure thing. Then there's the bigger philosophical question. Should we be doing this at all? The Sahara is a natural desert. It's been a desert for thousands of years. Some ecologists argue that trying to reverse desertification is just more human interference in systems we don't fully understand. That we're playing God with landscapes that have their own ecological value, even as deserts. Dr. Khatib's response to this is pretty straightforward. The Sahara might be natural, but the speed at which it's expanding is not. Climate change, caused by humans, is accelerating desertification. The Sahara grows by 10% every century now, compared to much slower rates historically. If human activity is making it worse, then human activity to make it better is an interference. It's correction. The project has also sparked interest in using bees for reforestation efforts in non-desert environments. Turns out, pollination is kind of important everywhere, not just in sandy wastelands. Who knew? Areas affected by wildfires, deforestation, or industrial damage could potentially use similar techniques. Release pollinators, plant native seeds, provide minimal support, and let nature rebuild itself. Some companies are already jumping on the bandwagon. A startup in California is working on bee bombing, literally dropping cocoons mixed with seeds from drones over areas that need reforestation. It sounds ridiculous, and maybe it is. But the Sahara Project proved that ridiculous can work. The biggest takeaway from all of this? Sometimes the solution to massive global problems isn't some high-tech innovation or billion-dollar program. Sometimes it's just understanding how nature already works and getting out of the way. Bees have been pollinating plants for 130 million years. They're pretty good at it. Giving them a chance to do their thing in places where they've been wiped out or never existed might be the smartest thing humanity has done in a while. So what's next? The team is expanding. 30 new sites across North Africa are being prepared for bee releases. They're also experimenting with different bee species, different plants and different irrigation techniques. The goal is to create a playbook, a guide that anyone, anywhere can use to start reversing desertification in their region. Governments are watching closely. Morocco has already pledged funding to scale the project tenfold. Algeria and Tunisia are in talks to start their own versions. Even countries outside Africa are paying attention. Australia, suffering from years of drought and expanding deserts, has sent researchers to study the Moroccan sites. 
The project also highlights something we tend to forget. Nature is incredibly resilient. We've spent the last few centuries assuming that once an ecosystem is destroyed, it's gone forever. But that's not true. Given half a chance, given the right conditions, nature bounces back fast. The Sahara sites went from barren to buzzing with life in 12 months. 12 months. That's faster than most government projects to fix a pothole. In the end, this whole experiment proves something simple but profound. Life wants to live. Throw millions of frozen bees into a hostile desert. And somehow, some way, they'll figure it out. They'll wake up, they'll adapt, and they'll start building something new. Not because they're programmed to save the world, but because that's just what life does. It persists. It finds a way. And maybe that's the real lesson here. If bees can survive the Sahara, maybe there's hope for the rest of us too. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, Hit that subscribe button. More stories of humans doing weird science coming soon.